Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Trinity Baptist Church as we meet together for worship uh, today. Um, there's a few notices. Uh, this morning, um, at the close of our meeting, uh, we'll need to hold a brief but important meeting for church members. So if church members could please remain in their seats uh, while we deal with one item of business. And then uh, we'd like to ask those who aren't members uh, to leave uh, the main church. And you can either go into the church hall where Jean has got a bookstore, uh, or wait outside the building until our brief meeting concludes. And then we'll uh, share refreshments together as soon as we can. And uh, we're sorry for any inconvenience, um, but uh, obviously we're following government guidelines as well, which are currently in force. Um, Thursday night uh, is a church night this week, um, and that will be on Zoom, so details for that will be sent out uh, during the week. Let's begin by uh, reading a verse from Psalm 115. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Let's pray. Dear loving and heavenly Father, as we meet together this morning amongst your people, we pray that we may know a sense of your presence with us, that as we worship and think on you, that our hearts may be drawn to love you more, that we may serve you with our lives. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're now going to have our first song come up and uh, the splendour of the King, so please remain seated and we'll follow the words as they are sung to us.
some? Yes. I wonder if you've ever been scared. Have you ever been afraid? Now, uh, maybe once you might have gone for a walk and you saw a big cow in a field and realised how big they are compared to you. And maybe you were a little bit scared then. And this one's got horns. Yes, it has. Well, maybe you're very brave and you weren't scared of that. What about a big hungry lion? Well, like that one. Maybe you saw one of those in the zoo. Or maybe you remember, I don't think we've had one yet this year, but last year maybe there was a thunderstorm you heard and big flashes of lightning and claps of thunder. Well, imagine, I don't know if any of you have got scared at this one. You were on a boat in a storm and the sea was going up and down. And I think there's a picture of a boat. (laughs) Maybe not. Anyway. (laughs) Um, But imagine for a moment that you saw that boat and it was going up and down on the storm. There it is. And there's a helicopter coming in to rescue it, or rescue the people on it, rather. I think, I think you might be a little bit scared then. Now, the this, this story we've got this morning for the grown-ups is about some disciples in a boat in a big storm. And Jesus was in that boat, and he was fast asleep. And the disciples got very scared, and they had to wake him up. Uh, they were worried that he didn't care about them. Well, it's good to be scared of some things, isn't it? We don't want to get eaten by a big hungry lion. But there are some things that we're scared of which we shouldn't be. Sometimes we're scared and afraid that God won't help us when things are difficult for us. But God has promised that if we trust in him, he will always be with us and he will always be good to us. And that was a lesson that the disciples of Jesus learnt in that storm. And so when you say your prayers tonight, perhaps with mummy or daddy, here's something that you can say to God. And the words have come up here. So the words are, thank you God that you are with us, even when we are scared and afraid, and that if we know Jesus, you will not leave us on our own. Perhaps we could pray those now. So you pray with me. Thank you, God, that you are with us, even when we are scared and afraid, and that if we know Jesus, you will not leave us on our own. Amen. Well, thank you very much for listening, and it's time now to go out to the crash. So I think this is a good time for you to go out, and I'm going to invite Peter to come up and he's going to lead everyone in the time of prayer. As we come to prayer, I'd just like to read one verse from Exodus, um, which covers the, ex- the, um, the deliverance of uh, Israel from uh, the Egyptians, and then they miraculously cross the Red Sea. And after all of that, Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord in just one verse. 
Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you, the awesome and wonderful and glorious God. And we thank you that you do wonderful things. And we thank you that there is none like you. You are the only one. And thank you that we can bring our worship and praise and thanks to you this day. Thank you, Lord, that you have been merciful and gracious to so many of us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. Thank you for the hope we have in our hearts. And Oh Lord, we're so grateful and we want to express that in song and in hearing your word and lifting our hearts to you now. Lord, we live in such a troubled world. We've just heard about a massacre in Burkina Faso. And Lord, that is just one of many sad, brutal incidents that take place in Africa. And Ethiopia and Eritrea are in the news. So many places where there is violence and hatred. And uh, Lord, we pray that where your people are involved, where they're affected by these things, that you be with them and, and help them. And in your mercy, please bring uh, relief or bring relief to India and Myanmar where things are so difficult. Lord, we pray you have mercy. And for Chinese people and Hong Kong people struggling with the, the brutality of their government, have mercy, Lord, we pray. And as we look forward to um, our meeting after the service, as we think about voting, as we vote for whether to call Matthew to the pastor of here. Lord, we ask that you help us. We pray as the church takes this big decision, we ask for your help and wisdom and your guidance in all that we do. So be with us, Lord. Help Matt as he preaches. Be with the children as they have their time just now. And may we bring you our praise and worship for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks very much, Peter. If you'd like to turn, if you have a Bible, uh, to uh, Mark and chapter 4, uh, the words will come up on the screen as well. Um, I'll read this. That day, when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the winds died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Father, as we consider your word this morning, Lord, we pray you would help it uh, to speak to each one of us. May your Holy Spirit apply the meaning of the passage to our hearts, that we may not go away unchanged by it. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a look at this passage in Mark chapter 4. And 
One of the world's most iconic images is that here of uh, the Japanese artist Hokusai, his great wave. And with Mount Fuji in the background, the foreground is dominated by something that resembles our passage this morning. It's a great storm with fishing boats threatened by the enormous wave hanging in midair and about to crash down on these helpless boats. And perhaps the most obvious thing that we can see in the picture is the helplessness of human beings in the awesome power of nature. And so it's a universal human experience. It's one which everyone can relate to. And scenes like this are very vivid in our imagination and our history. And they're vivid in scripture too. We can only think of Noah's flood, Jonah and the whale, and Paul's shipwreck at Malta. These are the moments of jeopardy, where life hangs in the balance. They're times that we remember that we're small, we're ill-equipped, and we're powerless. And that's the experience of the disciples in the boat with Jesus in our passage. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat and it was nearly swamped. And this morning we're going to look at this passage very simply. There are three questions here to look at. There's the question that the disciples ask of Jesus. Don't you care? There's the question that Jesus asks the disciples. Why are you so afraid? And there's the question that the disciples ask each other. Who is this? So let's consider the first question, the one that the disciples ask Jesus. Don't you care? Don't you care? In the terror and the panic of the storm, everything is going very badly wrong. Jesus was asleep, and that must have been something which was incredibly annoying to them. And we read that the disciples woke him and said to them, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? When the great artist Rembrandt imagines this scene of Christ in the storm, the disciples are in the boat, battling furiously against the waves and straining every muscle to row to safety. They're clearly in terror and losing the fight. But there's one detail which makes that painting more than just a depiction of the imagined scene. There is a message in there. Because Rembrandt the artist paints himself as one of the disciples in the boat. And he's looking straight out of the painting and straight at you, the viewer. And it's as if to say, don't imagine yourself out there looking in on this scene. Friend, you're in the boat. You are a participant in this great unfolding drama. And so as we read this passage this morning, it's not just for us as if we are on the outside, looking in. We are, in fact, in the boat. And we may share in this same experience of being overwhelmed, of being reminded that we are small and ill-equipped and we are powerless. And we might see those experiences as the storms of life. And there are times when we're reminded that we're not in control. And it's fair to say we spend a great time uh, thinking that we are in control and we do like to control things and surround ourselves with things that we can keep within our knowledge and our understanding and our influence. But sometimes in our life a storm comes and it plays havoc with the sense of ourselves and reminds us that we are in fact very small. And we've probably had some of those experiences and there will be people who have had a great many. The disciples' experience of the storm invokes that feeling of things being inexplicable, threatening and fearful. And they can be our experience too. Whether that sudden bereavement, debilitating illness, financial loss, desertion by friends, false accusations, lockdown even. When the storm comes, how do we react? Are we tempted to think that God has deserted us? that we're on our own? Are we afraid? Do we cry out to Jesus, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? God, 
Don't you care? And the trouble with this question, as the disciples asked it, is that they asked it in a rhetorical way. They'd assumed the answer. They assumed that because Jesus is asleep, he cannot care. Is that us? And maybe we wouldn't call ourselves a Christian today. And we might ask it like this, if there is a God, then doesn't he care? And yet the Christian may also find themselves asking a very similar question. Yes, I believe, but because of what I'm going through, Lord, don't you care? But one thing we learn from this passage, though, is that the questions can go both ways. Jesus is quite capable of asking questions of us. And so after he had miraculously calmed the storm, he has a question for his disciples. And that brings us to our second question. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? I wonder, is this a question from Jesus to us, as well as to these disciples? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? See, Jesus' searching question is very specific. He's aiming at one particular thing, a faithless fear. Jesus doesn't say, why is there a storm? Have you still have do you, why why have you why is there a storm? Have you still no faith? He's not troubled at all by the storm. And he doesn't say, Why did you wake me? Have you still no faith? No, he's not troubled about being woken up. What he does say is, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? He's troubled by the kind of fear that he sees in the disciples, because their fear betrays what they think. Jesus notes that they are so afraid. And I don't think he means it's just a case of excessive fear, too much fear. The sort of fear that we can say, well, okay, guys, we understand you might get a little pale and seasick with the wind noise and the boat going up and down, but really there's no reason to panic. I don't think he's saying, guys, you're a little bit too afraid. You need to be a bit more serene and maybe take up some breathing exercises or something to help you in these stormy times. I think he's very much taking aim at the type of fear that they exhibit. Their fear is existential. It is all-consuming. In the face of the threat posed by nature, they conclude that they must be supernaturally abandoned. When threatened by the storm, they conclude that God doesn't care about them. And this is the kind of fear that Jesus rebukes them for. It is the fear that is the opposite of faith. It is the opposite of confidence in God's goodness. It is giving over to a questioning of the very nature of God. It's concluding that he doesn't care, that he's gonna desert them, and ultimately they're gonna perish in the storm. You see, the storm showed them that they weren't in control. And they didn't like that very much, just as we don't like it very much. But Jesus is leading them to see exactly that. They're not in control, but they need to have faith in the one who is. And like these disciples, when faced with a storm in our lives, it is often then that we really find out about ourselves, what we really think and what we're really trusting in. Do we fear in the way these disciples fear Have we yet come to an end of our own abilities and are now able to put faith in Jesus? To say that we have faith is of no value whatsoever. The point is what is our faith in? Is it in ourselves, our ability to manage situations? Is it in other people and their ability to provide solutions? Jesus calls us to abandon our own self-reliance and have faith in him. For faith to have a value, it must be in Jesus Christ. Because he is faithful, he is God, and he is able to still the storm. Jesus is good, and he has our good at heart. He will not abandon us in the storms of life. He will keep us trusting in him and he will bring us safe to shore. Although we mean, may, maybe mean something when we talk of having more faith or less faith, I don't think we mean very much 
compared to the question of having faith at all. Our faith may not be strong, but that will not condemn us, because he is strong. Our faith may be exercised, yes, when the crashing waves of circumstance, doubt, depression, grief and despair surround us, when those things threaten to overwhelm us. But remember, if we have Christ in the boat, all will be well. I think it's important to note this does not mean that there will be no storms in our lives. And it does not mean that if we have faith, Jesus will calm the storms in our lives. We have to remember that in this passage, Jesus calmed a storm for the disciples who didn't seem to demonstrate any faith. And equally, he doesn't promise plain sailing for those who do have faith. The Bible doesn't allow us that simple logic of having enough faith and your problems will go away. The faith we have as Christians is faith in Jesus Christ that he will lead us through the storm, that his direction for our lives is not arbitrary or mistaken. He has not abandoned us. God has his purposes in storms and he will fulfill those good purposes. These disciples that we read about here they were obediently following Jesus when they got into that boat. It was Jesus' idea after all, as you can read in verse 35. They were not running away from God like Jonah famously did. This storm here was not a storm that was sent to make them change direction. This was a storm that came along where, even though they were doing the right thing in following Jesus. God will accomplish his purposes in the storms in our lives. And we may not always or even often understand why they came, but he calls us to trust him all the same. And here in this passage, we can see something of the purpose that God had in the storm and by its effects. It is a miracle here, but the miracle or sign had a purpose. It wasn't just a case of Jesus saying, hey guys, see what I can do, I can still storms. Jesus was very much saying, see who I am. Think big thoughts about me, expand your horizons. Don't think that I am powerless in this situation. And so the disciples, they're left questioning and bewildered at the end of their passage. But theirs is a good question. It's a good question to ask, and it would seem that it was the purpose of the storm and the miracle to bring them to the place where they asked themselves this question. Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So we'll look at this question of, who is this? Who is this? For the disciples, it's an obvious question. From what they've seen, Jesus does not belong to ordinary categories. Here is a man who did miracles in his own authority. He didn't publicly address a request to God or receive instructions from him. And that was the sort of thing the Old Testament prophets did. The miracles that they did were done at God's command, like when Moses divided the Red Sea. Or they followed prayer to God we can think of that like when Elijah prayed for the fire to come from heaven. But here is someone who says to the sea, quiet, be still. And in that moment, all that kinetic energy of the wind and the waves, it dissipates at that command. Normally speaking, even when the wind stops, the waves will continue for hours or days. But here we read that the wind died down and it was completely calm. It happened because Jesus said so. So here is someone in a different category to their prophets of old. Here is Jesus, who while fully man is also fully God. We see the absolute distinction between the disciples and between them and Jesus. Where the disciples in this passage, they look very much like us. But Jesus looks unlike us, or indeed anyone who has ever lived. And this is a passage that gives us perspective, doesn't it? 
For the disciples, this was true. They started out being fearful of the storm. But we read that when it was calm, they were terrified and asked each other that question, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. In other words, the storm, which had been the really big thing for them, was, it no longer seemed quite so important. There was a bigger question to face. As terrifying as the crashing waves may be, it is only when we see Jesus as the one to whom the storm is subject, the one who has power over the storm, that we truly know what must be reckoned with, or more particularly, who must be reckoned with. Whatever is going on in yours or my life, whether we are yet Christians or not, those things in our life seem like the biggest thing. But if Jesus, if Jesus is Lord over the wind and waves, then the things which make us afraid are much less important than the one who has power over those things. He is to be feared more than they. If we have a true perspective on Jesus as Lord over creation, then we would naturally speaking feel exactly like these disciples felt, terrified. Terrified at the realisation there is no limit to God's power over our lives. Terrified that there is no limit to God's knowledge of our hearts. Terrified that we cannot dismiss Jesus as someone who is just interesting. He is someone we must reckon with. When we see a glimpse of his glory and power, of course, that will make us to fear him, to bow down before him and ask, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Yet fear is not his ultimate aim, because he invites us not to stay there on the outside, but to know and to love him. He invites us to have relationship to him as Lord, as saviour, as teacher, as friend, as brother. And it's fair to say that in this passage, he loves the disciples, doesn't he? They didn't seem to have faith in him, yet he calmed the storm. Though they said he didn't care, he was tender with them. He showed them his power and his glory that they might know that he could be trusted no matter what. The storm is not, is not beyond his control. So this passage is an invitation to faith. Here, the Gospel writers invite you to receive their testimony about Jesus. He is Lord of heaven and earth. The wind and waves are no match for the power of his voice. And if the wind and waves are no match for him, then is anything beyond his power. Yet for someone who has such power, power over the winds and waves, he dignifies his disciples by reasoning with them. He humbles himself by becoming their teacher. He entrusts himself to them by being asleep in their boats. This passage shows Jesus as he is, God and man, a human nature and a divine nature. In his humanity he is asleep after a long day working hard. In his divinity he is awake, sustaining the universe from the movement of the stars and planets to the Earth's weather systems to the location of every atom. There are a couple of practical points that arise out of the absolute uniqueness and distinctiveness of Jesus. And we see that here, don't we, compared to everyone else in the boat. And practically, it should lead us in two directions. Firstly, let us not put faith in Jesus' disciples, but in Jesus himself. And this is so true in church life. From the preacher at the front to any Christian that we admire, dead or alive, Jesus' disciples are entirely capable of being seized by fear when the storms come. We would be foolish to put ultimate faith in the wrong place. Jesus alone can offer absolute reliability, dependability. He is the rock on which we can build our lives. And secondly, the flip side of this thought about the uniqueness of Jesus should lead us to compassion and generosity with our fellow disciples. For when the storms of life come into any one of our lives, and perhaps people will struggle with questions about God's goodness, struggle with faith even, we should remind ourselves that we are 
all, in essence, in the same boat. We're prone to the very same fears, and each of us will learn, and that will be falteringly at times, what it means to follow Jesus when we're faced with unexpected challenges. This should lead us to patience, gentleness, and kindness with each other. As we remember that we are not the exceptional Christians, only Jesus stands out in this storm. If we're Christians today, we are all in the same boat, but crucially, not just with each other. Jesus presents himself as one who is present with his people by his Holy Spirit. And when we're going through the storms, he is with us and he is alongside us in all that his people go through. And sometimes when storms come and threaten the happiness and security of God's people, we might be tempted to fear that God has left us. We might fear that Jesus is asleep and that we're going to have to battle these storms on our own. And at times, things might feel like they go from bad to worse, and we wonder where it must all end. However, these three questions this morning help us. There's a question we might already be asking of God, don't you care? A question that we need to hear Jesus asking of us, why are you so afraid? And a question that hopefully we've come to know the answer to, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. God has not abandoned us. He's in the boat. And of course he can sleep. He's the creator of the universe. He is the maker of wind and waves. If he's in the boat with us, then ultimately, what is there left to fear? We're going to cl conclude by sitting and listening uh, to our final song, which is a sovereign protector. I have a great a song of confidence in God and his protection and presence with us.
Father, as we conclude this meeting, you know our hearts, you know how prone to fear we are. But Lord, we thank you that you are tender and gracious with us. And Lord, that you do not respond to our fear as it might deserve, but Lord, that you bring us on and that you show us yourself, that we may have faith and confidence in you. So Lord, give us that faith and confidence as we go out this week to know your presence every day of our lives. We thank you 